right, you guys doing good? Good morning, it's good to be with you. Uh, let's do this. Uh, there are people that stood outside and helped you park cars. Uh, those are all volunteers. Should we say thank you to them on this day? Amazing, amazing. I can't believe that. That is awesome. And uh, yeah, so yeah, Kelly said thank you to those who do the roundup. I want to thank the people that pay the heating bill around here. It is so freezing cold outside. And so uh, great to be in here and be here with you. Um, you know, their love story, their marriage started the way you'd want any love story to begin, like any Hollywood movie, like a romance novel. I mean, it was complete with all the characters. You had the, the bad guys, the Philistines, were on this side, across the valley, up on a hill, and they had a champion named Goliath who would come out every day and challenge the good guys, the Israelite people. He'd come out and say, who will come against me. It was kind of a tradition back then that uh, they, each army would send out one champion. And because they believed that God's really determined the, the ebb and flow of everything, a lot of times to save bloodshed, the loss of life, they would just send one champion out. And whoever won, the other army would submit and go, well, I mean, our God would have lost anyway, right? So that's what was going on. Goliath is saying, who will come against me? And over here, you've got King Saul. And King Saul, he can't get anybody to go against this guy. He's huge. He's a war machine. And so he's making an offer to everybody. Hey, if anybody will go against this guy, you will have no taxes for the rest of your life. Can I get an amen? Would that not be amazing, right? No taxes for the rest of your life, and you can have my daughter's hand in marriage. Enter into the scene our hero, David. Now, he's not a warrior. He was there giving lunch to his brothers who were warriors, but he heard what Goliath was saying, shaming his God and his people, and he heard this offer from King Saul. And so he, in 1 Samuel 17, uh, 17 says, freedom from taxes is quite pleasing, but can I see a picture of Michael? Your daughter, no, he didn't say that, I'm just joking. What he does is he says, I'm gonna go up against Goliath. And so he defeats Goliath in this grand romantic gesture. Like he wins the hand of the fair maiden. He, he, he's the champion of his people. He's the underdog that goes against. I mean, everything in this story, in this relationship, just starts out the way you want it to start out. But then there's a conflict. Which I'm kind of glad that the Bible includes the conflicts in relationships. Because you, you kind of imagine that the Bible's just going to have perfect families, Perfect relationships, everybody, all the heroes are just, you know, never have a problem. But I love that the Bible just gives you the real picture of what's going on. And so it, it tells you that there's a conflict between David and Michael. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, I'll give you the background of it basically in 2 Samuel 6. The Ark of the Covenant has been captured by the Philistines. So they were defeated and then they rose again, and the Philistines and the Israelites have been kind of skirmishing back and forth over the years. David and Michael are now married. They've started, you know, uh, they're into their marriage. And the Philistines have captured the Ark of the Covenant. If you don't know anything about biblical history or Indiana Jones, you know that the Ark of the Covenant is this gold chest. It houses the Ten Commandments, the original Moses ones. And the people saw this as a relic where it represented God's, um, God's presence in their life. So if the, if the Israelites had the Ark of the Covenant, they would go out and do battle and they would win and everything would be great. If they didn't have the Ark of the Covenant, it was, you know, it was feeble, they wouldn't win, it was not good. And so when the Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant, uh, it's a big deal. So David goes out and gets it, and he's coming back from the battlefield. He comes into his hometown. People are lining the streets. The music starts playing as the victory parade comes down the street. And as the music is playing, David starts dancing, okay? He starts dancing, and I guess he gets hot or sweaty or something because the Bible says that he gets naked, all right? So, I mean, that's just, I mean, th imagine a world leader, like, dancing at a big parade and then getting naked. Are you thinking about Trump right now? Because that's just disgusting. But anyway, so, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so, David, uh, this is political as I get. But anyway, 
So David comes down the street and, um, and he starts sweating, takes off his clothes. Now, it's really, it's really that he took off his kingly robes. It says, uh, it's translated unclothed, basically, not just naked. And, and it could be that he's like boxer shorts. Like he didn't get totally naked. It could be that he had sort of just common clothes on and not his kingly official robes. Does that make sense? But for whatever reason, maybe he was just doing it because he wanted to be more free when he danced. You ever done that at a wedding, like taking your coat off at a wedding, rolled up your sleeves? I did that at a wedding after I had been the officiant at the wedding. And so for whatever reason, like when I got up, moved to the dance floor, I start taking my coat off, I rolled up my sleeves, I turned around and everybody had backed up like, ooh, let's see what the pastor has, to which I'm like, I got nothing. I can't dance at all, like maybe a little of this or whatever, but that's it, you know? But anyway, so David does this and Michael does not like it and that's where we find ourselves today. So are we all caught up? All right, let's zoom in on, chat, on verse 20, it says this. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. You can hear the sarcasm, am I right? You can almost hear the snapping of her fingers, like how the king has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. Vulgar can also be translated common. And so perhaps that was her issue too, that the kingly robes were off and now he's just hanging out. He's acting like a commoner and she wants him to be, I mean, she's from a royal family herself. She wants maybe, I don't know what the issue is, but she's mad. So David comes back at her and says, oh honey, I am so sorry. Can you help me understand, sweetheart? What, no, he doesn't say that at all. David fires back. Uh, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father. Did y'all ever bring up the in-laws in a fight? Does that, <laughs> does that go well for you? It doesn't go well for me, man. And it didn't go well for David at all. He's like, he, he, God chose me. He got all spiritual about it. God chose me instead of your father or anyone from his house. Nobody in your family, by the way. Uh, when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel, I will say, you know what? I will dance. I will celebrate before the Lord. In fact, I'm going to become even more undignified than this lady. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. Like, I'm just going to go, I'm just I'm going to lose it. But by these slave girls you spoke of, oh, they going to like me. Like, I mean, he is just like in her face. I will be held in honor. I mean, this is not good. This is not good relationship, okay? And, and then in verse 23, we see how it ends. In verse 23, it says, And Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her, her death. <laughs> this is church talk. <laughs> for there was no intimacy. <laughs> Uh, from that point forward, and the, the, it's sad that the marriage is pretty much over at that point. That's it, so here's what I wanna do. I wanna look over their shoulder, learn from their negative ex example, see if we can't apply some good stuff. Are you with me? All right, so the first lesson that I see in here is this. If you're not winning at home, you're not winning. David is out, and in his kingly career, is like on a mountaintop. He has captured the Ark of the Covenant from the evil Philistines, he is coming back home, he is on, I mean, he's killing it in his career. But he gets home, and you find out, I mean, by the way that they just jumped at each other, something's been brewing for a while. I mean, am I right? He just, he goes at her, she goes at him, he goes at her, it's just, so he is not doing well at home. Listen, your 401k can be up and to the right, your career can be on fire. You can be skipping steps up the ladder of success. You're going so fast. But if you're not winning at home, you're not winning. God's design for you is not simply to go make money or to go be successful in a career. God has a more holistic idea of success. All right? Have you ever heard of uh, rich people that are not successful? Or have you ever heard of somebody who's got an incredible physique and yet they're not good at other things? Here's the deal. 
For us around here, we talk about RPMs. That's what you saw beforehand with the car going, whatever. It's RPMs. This series is basically looking at the fact that we want to be successful in all the areas that God calls us to be successful. So, I mean, there's many, but here's the thing. Here's four. Relationally. If you're not winning at home, you're not winning. If you don't have good friendships, you're not winning. Physically. You ever heard somebody say, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. And it's true. I mean, if you're killing yourself just to get that new promotion or whatever, but physically, like you're, you know, uh, uh, you're stressed out, you've got the ulcers, or you're eating yourself to death because of all the stress or whatever, then you're not doing it right. You're not winning at life. Here's the other one, mentally. Are you depressed? Are you stressed out? Is there all kinds of anxiety in your life? Or have you kind of topped out when it comes to development? Like leaders are learners, we do not, as Christ followers, get to some you know, level in life and go, okay, I don't need to learn anymore, I don't need to develop anymore, I don't need to grow as a person anymore. That's not the way it is. God would have you reach your full potential. That's, you know, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Like, let's get, okay, so mentally. And then spiritually, that's number one. You get, you get all the other three right, you still don't have it right if, you, if your relationship with God is not where it needs to be. <clears throat> and so this series, over the next few weeks, we're gonna look at each one of those. And so if you're somebody that has body issues, you deal with uh, fitness issues, um, eating disorder, whatever, we're gonna talk about that stuff next week. What does God say about that? And maybe you know somebody that needs to hear that. Will you bring them? Same with uh, mentally. Do you, you know somebody with anxiety? Would you bring them? spiritually, people that need to take a next step with God, would you bring them? That's what we're gonna talk about. And the first, the first point is this. If you're not winning at home, you are not winning. David was a great king in that moment, but that was about it, right? And God wants a more holistic understanding. Here's the second point. Don't do life alone. In other words, the R in RPMs is not just about your family. You're gonna need friendships as well. Before this season of failure in David's life, you go back a couple chapters, you're going to find a guy named Jonathan. Jonathan and David are historic friends. I mean, that's what they're known for in Scripture is the kind of relationship that they had. They were, they were friends. And Jonathan was David's nemesis, Saul's son. And yet Jonathan and David still had this tight relationship the Bible talks about that. In fact, in 1 Samuel 20, uh, verse one, David asked Jonathan, hey, what have I done? What is my crime? In other words, their relationship and their, their conversation wasn't just about sports and the weather. They actually had real, intense conversations with each other about life. Do you have friends like that? Do you have some people in your life that can speak truth to you? Here's the thing. After, that was before the season of failure in David's life, after that season of failure in David's life, Nathan, the prophet, comes along and actually confronts David about sin and, and causes David to repent from his sin and saves him from complete destruction and ruin. Do you have somebody in your life that can look at you and say, hey, you, this area in your life is not lining up with Scripture. It's not lining up with what God's will is in the Bible for your life. And I love you enough that I will risk the awkwardness of this conversation so that you can get on track with what God has for your life. Do you have anybody like that in your life? The place where we use the RPMs most in this church is in a coaching relationship. You hear us talk about small groups. You all should be in a small group. You are not gonna grow spiritually at the pace that God would have you grow by coming one hour a week and staring at the back of somebody's head, right? Real life change happens so much uh, better in circles than in rows. And so we'd love for you to get in circles called small groups around here. But even in those small groups, guys, we get a couple of guys together, a couple of ladies together, and we have a coaching relationship. And one of those questions that's always asked is how are you doing with your RPMs? 
How you doing relationally? No, how you really doing? How you doing physically? How can I encourage you in that? Mentally, spiritually, how can we help each other take next steps with God? That's a big deal. And so I would tell you, don't do life alone. African proverb says, if you wanna go fast, go alone. But if you wanna go far, go together. How might it have been different in this episode of David's relationship if he had Nathan or Jonathan who witnessed this thing and immediately run over to David and go, David, David, you can't let this, come on, let's talk about this. Or run over to Michael and say, hey, let's sit down. You guys obviously have got some real issues going on. Can we help you sort through this? Man, do you have people like that in your life? That's gonna be so important in relationships. So again, we're not just talking about a marriage relationship, we're talking about friendships. Uh, we're talking about you and your teenager. The R is all of those relationships. All right, let's learn from uh, some other of David's mistakes. Here we go. Choose to identify the heart of the issue. David did not do that. David did not immediately go, okay, she is obviously mad about something here. Um, honey, uh, can we talk? No, he just jumps right back at her. How many of you know that often when we say something or we do something that's a little aggressive, a little out of frustration, that there's usually something behind that? And if we could understand the heart of the issue, it might help us resolve the problem. In other words, is the issue really that your husband came home late again, or is it that you're starting to feel that he values work more than he cherishes you and the kids? And if you really if you really felt like he cherished you and you were secure in that, would it be all that big a deal if he came home a half hour late? Or flip it on its ear. Is it really that you get so upset that you gotta roll your eyes and go, ugh, when she says, hey, can you take the garbage out? Or is it that you, behind that, sort of feel like she disrespects you? And if you were very secure in the respect that she had for you, would it really mean that, would it be that big a deal if she said, hey, could you help, me? could you take the garbage out? Like, what is behind the issue? And to figure that out, it's gonna require two things, which is listening and expressing your feelings. Well, the problem is, there's usually somebody, at least in a marriage relationship, that's not so good at that. And it's usually the same person that forgets to put the toilet seat down. We guys are not usually great at listening or expressing our feelings, but that's no excuse just because it's hard. We ought to, and think of how different it might have been for David had he listened to what James said. 119, it says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Does that verse characterize your conflict resolution? Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry because then we might be able to get to the heart of the issue. It's like, hey, David, maybe, maybe she just wanted to be a part of the celebration with you. Maybe as you were dancing out there, she was just hoping that at some point you would like, you do you know, this and say, come on out. And you guys could like dance together and it would feel like in front of Israel, like, hey, we did this together. I was supporting him. He was supporting me. We are a team in this thing. Maybe that's the issue, David. Or, hey, David, maybe, maybe if you'd listen instead of fire back, maybe you'd realize that, hey, surprise, she'd worked two months uh, putting these kingly robes together. She designed them herself, and you threw them in the dirt. And maybe that's the issue. Or maybe she's jealous of these slave girls, and David, all you needed to do was just wrap your arm around her and say, honey, there's nobody in this world for me but you, and just reassure her of that. I mean, you understand? Like, if David would, would, would not just fire back, he could get to the heart of the issue. Okay, we gotta keep going. Here's another thing. Find a good time and a place to address the issue. Is this the right time and place 
for Michael to confront her husband about his dancing. I mean, right in the midst, in front of all of his peers, in front of the people, in front of all these people, she's like, how dare you, you know? No, it's not. Uh, ladies, I don't know if you know this, but guys have an ego. Have you ever encountered that? Like, we don't like to be embarrassed, and, and yet she you know, confronts him in that way. Guys, there is a time and a place to do these things. And a lot of times, I've said this before, a lot of times, you know, in bed at night, when you fall into bed exhausted, that's not the best time. I mean, you know how this, I mean, if you're married, you know how this goes. If you've got kids, you wake up in the morning, maybe you pop off at one or the other because you're tired and it, it creates a rift and maybe you, or maybe you text each other during the day or whatever, you're fighting. And so you get through your long day and then everybody's at home. You gotta do dinner. Then you gotta clean up after dinner. Oh, then so-and-so's gotta go to soccer and so-and-so needs help with their homework. And then we got bath time for little one. And next thing you know, it's like 10 o'clock and you fall into bed exhausted. You roll over and look at each other and go, all right, let's get at it. <laughs> when you are not prepared to do that, you're exhausted. And then, and this is my little soapbox because I, I'm a, I grew up a church kid. Christians have added to it this little verse in the Bible that says, uh, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Have you heard this? Right? So we think to ourselves, well, that means even though I'm exhausted and it's a horrible time to do a conflict resolution, I cannot go to sleep unless we do. So we end up four o'clock in the morning like, uh, like a boxer who's punched out just going, ah, yeah, you know, and it's just, it's just wasted energy when what we could do is because that Bible verse is basically saying, hey, you can't let arguments go on. You need to resolve it. That's the point. What we could do is say, hey, you know what? Obviously, we're both exhausted. I want you to know that, that I love you. You're kind of a jerk, but I love you. Okay, no, you don't say that. He says, I love you, and obviously, as you submit yourself to the Lord, I submit myself to the Lord, we are gonna work this out. So we both know that. Let's get to sleep. And let's meet together tomorrow for coffee where we'll be in a better place to resolve this. Is that good? Does that sound right? And then, you know, just roll over and go to sleep with a little bit of peace. And next thing you know, you're not wasting all kinds of energy. That's my little tip for you. I believe that's a better way to do it. The right time and the right place. Here's another one. Start with something positive. Michael could have said, David, you are such a strong warrior. David, you're an incredible dancer. However, uh, if we could talk, I, I just was a little freaked out about how you were eyeing the slave girls. And I wanna talk about that with you. Like, there's a better way to have done it. And so you could start positively as well. Instead of saying, Tim, it's 30 minutes late. What are you doing? You could say, Tim, I've always known you to be a pretty responsible guy. Uh, and so you being 30 minutes late made me go, is everything okay? I mean, are you doing all right? You see how that's a little better? Or instead of walking in the room and going, green shag carpet, are you kidding me? You could say, you know, I've always known you to be a, a fine decorator, and <laughs> so if you could help me understand your thought process here in this color choice, be, you understand? I mean, just see, you can be more strategic about this thing and start with something positive. Okay, number, here's the other one. Stick to the issue. Don't make it about something that it's not. She says, David, I got a problem with you dancing uh, half naked in front, of, in front of these slave girls. David's like, oh, let's talk about your dad. LAUGHTER <laughs> I mean, are you just surprised? If you're married, I don't mean, if you're married, do you ever get surprised at how often the in-laws are involved in these things? I mean, it's just, it's crazy. My wife, I mean, we got, like, my wife's maiden name was Hanson, and then she married a dummit. <laughs> I mean, I feel bad for her right there. That's just sad. But here's the other thing. Her father is the manliest man you will ever meet. Okay, this guy, he's in his 60s right now, but he is still hiking in Yellowstone. He is still can't, like extreme camping. He, like, he goes in the woods barehanded, builds a house. Like he's just, 
amazing. And you guys, because I know this is Michigan, and you guys are amazing hunters, you go out and hunt with a rifle, you go out and hunt with a bow. He hunts with a falcon. You don't even know what that is. Go look it up. He is a falconer, folks. He goes up and he gets a baby falcon, a hawk out of the thing. He raises it from infancy and teaches it and trains it to kill things for him. When I, <laughs> when I came to her house for the first time, we weren't married. Her mother said, um, Dave, uh, you, you make yourself at home. You want to get something out of the fridge? It's totally fine. So, I, okay, all right. So later on, I'm, I open the fridge and there's a Ziploc bag of frozen chicken heads. I'm like, what kind of voodoo family <laughs> has chicken heads? It, literally, and, and I don't know if you've ever seen a frozen chicken head, but they all apparently open their mouth before they die because they're just like, it was disgusting. I'm like, oh my gosh, what is going on? The hawk eats chicken heads. I didn't know that, right? And, but I'm just telling you, he was, cr anyway, I'm totally off subject, but here's the thing. <laughs> David says, God chose me instead of your dad. He made it about something that it wasn't. And, and guys, anytime that you start bringing up old past things or making it a wider issue, making it, just make it about the thing. Resolve that, right? Don't bring the past up. Many people ruin a new day with an old day. A lot of people will ruin a new day with an old day. Don't do that. 1 Corinthians 13 says it this way. It says, love does not keep a record of wrongs. Does that sound wise to you? Does that not just ring true? And I'm talking about your relationship with your teenager. I'm talking about your business partner. And I'm talking about your spouse and your friends. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Resolve it and then let it go. And then uh, this last one, don't confuse conflict with a competition. There's conflicts and there's a competition. You see it immediately when Michael attacks David, he puffs up and immediately, like he's gonna win this thing. Because if you see what's happening as a competition, then there is a winner and there is a loser. And doggone it, I'm not gonna be the loser, right? You do it, I'll prove it to you. Listen to this. Have you ever gotten into an argument that goes over the course of a couple of days, or a couple of weeks maybe, and eventually you forget what you're arguing about? Really? Raise your hand if that's you. Okay, raise your hand if the person next to you has ever done that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, I'm not the only one. Let me give you another one. Let me give you another one. You ever get into a fight and then at some point realize you're wrong and yet you keep fighting anyway? <laughs> like I will win this even though I'm completely wrong because you're thinking winner and loser. You're not looking at it right. Here's one uh, with, with, you could, uh, with Rachel and I. Uh, one, time, uh, one time I won an argument with Rachel and one time and <laughs> You know, she, uh, she basically, when I said something that made sense and then whatever, and then she goes, you're right. And she walked away. And I'm over here doing a touchdown dance like, that's right. Ha, <laughs> I will, yeah, I am right. <laughs> and alone, I am. <laughs> Because I'm telling you, in a relationship, if it's a competition, there's a winner and there's a loser and there's a loser. It just makes two losers. It really does. Because it's not a competition. It is a conflict. And you are on the same side. Your competition is the evil one who is doing everything he can to, to destroy healthy relationships. You are on the same side. And if you both will just bow your heads in submission to the Lord, you will eventually take next steps with God. And as you grow closer to the Lord, you will inevitably cl grow closer to each other and you will win. And your relationship will be better, stronger on the other side of a conflict than it was before. And now guess what you have? Two winners. It's a conflict to be worked through, not a competition to win or lose. 
Well, King David's story did not end well. And it's a shame, you know, because when they were standing and looking at each other at the altar, that's not the way they envisioned the story going. You know, they had high hopes. They, they imagined beautiful things happily ever after. And you did too. You stood in that front of that altar looking at each other and you imagined a beautiful love story. When they handed you that little bundle of joy and you started thinking about what they're gonna be like at four years old and, and 10 years old and, and growing up, I mean, you had an incredible story in mind for your little one. And we could keep going, I mean, it, when you shook hands and they said, welcome to the team, and you, you thought about what it was gonna be like at this new career, you envisioned a story, and, and yeah, it might not be lining up with reality, but can I tell you the difference between your story and David's? His story's finished, and yours is still being written. Your story is still being written and you're following, you have the opportunity to follow a God who has an incredible way of bringing plot twists like you've never seen. 